Your ears do not deceive you. You have just entered the Cryptid Creator Corner brought to you by your friends at Comic Book Yeti. So without further ado, let's get on to the interview. Hey, comics fam. I wanted to tell you about this amazing new Kickstarter project funding soon from my friend David Rodriguez. It follows the adventures of three young heroes chosen by mystical gems of power and trained in a secret program called Guardian Battle Force Mexico. The world's first Aztec Super Sentai control three unique guardian spirits, the jaguar, the hummingbird, and the unicorn to defend the children from an ancient evil that haunts their nightmares. I got an advanced look at this and it blew me away. Artist Stefano Simeone is top-level talent having worked on Mega Man, Radiant Black, and Star Wars, among other things. And this is a perfect fit for a story that has something of a cross between so many of the team-oriented 80s cartoons I love. I interviewed David a couple years ago for his graphic novel, Finding Gossamer, and I've been looking forward to seeing what he does next. This has the look of something that will definitely get picked up by a major publisher, so get in on the ground floor. Head over to Kickstarter and search for Battle Mex to sign up for notifications when this thing goes live. I've also dropped a link in the show notes to make it easy for you. It will be available in both English and Spanish, which I absolutely love. This podcast has always been about promoting diversity and inclusion in comics, and it makes it so much more accessible to a wider community of new, younger readers. Don't miss it. Hello and welcome, listeners, to Comic Book Yeti's Cryptid Creator Corner podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jimmy Gasparro, and uh, I'm really excited to talk to my guest tonight. And we may have another guest joining us. We'll have to wait and see. But right now, I have uh, a comic book uh, and a book book writer of uh, Extraordinaire, um, who I'm very excited to talk to about Mad Cave's newest comic book, uh, Dick Tracy. Uh, issue number one is out April 24th. And um, I have uh, it's co-written by my next guest, Alex Segura and Michael Morisi with art by Geraldo Borges. Uh, it's a fantastic creative team. We'll get into everybody else involved. But please, please welcome to the podcast, uh, Alex Segura. Alex, how are you doing tonight? I'm good, man. Thanks so much for having me, Jimmy. I appreciate it. Happy to be here. Uh, no, I'm very excited. I mean, my... I, I really love Mad Cave. I've, I try to get a lot of Mad Cave creators on just because I'm really excited by a lot of the stuff that they have coming out. I was excited to hear that um, Mad Cave was going to put out a Dick Tracy book, uh, uh, mainly because I, I my only exposure, I think, really to Dick Tracy was like the 1990 movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't had a whole lot. Uh, uh, I haven't had a whole lot of exposure or reading the, you know, the old. I think it's Chester Gould like comic strip, which right. I mean, I think he did for like 40 some years between like the late thirties and, and the seventies. Um, but I'm, you know, familiar with the character and uh, thought it was very interesting that mad cave was kind of bringing this back. And when I heard the creative team, I was very excited. Um, I've been a big fan of both yours and uh, Michael's, you know, writing for a while now. Oh, thanks. And uh, have getting to read, issue one and seeing Geraldo Borges artwork um, it's colored by Mark. Yeah. Colored by Mark Angler. I've uh, been a big fan of Jim Campbell's lettering for a long time. And also there's a creative consultant on it, mm-hmm. Chantel Osmond, but what a first issue. Oh, thanks. I mean, I'm all in on this new <laughs> Dick Tracy, which, you know, I, I, I remember the imagery and the, the visual style of like the movie, but this is such a great grounded, kind of dark uh take on this character i i just fantastic first issue so oh uh, thanks so much I yeah i appreciate it yeah um yeah what to say I, I mean it's been a long road to getting to this point michael and i have and Chantel and i have really pushed hard to get this to happen and thankfully mad cave was really keen on publishing uh dick tracy and also really being part of this bigger kind of pulp hero initiative they're working on with flash gordon and uh uh, the gotcha man stuff. And, you know, I, we're just so excited to be able to introduce this take on the character, which, which I feel honors what's come before and honors the film honors Chester Gould's work honors the work of the current comic strip, but just kind of presents it from a different angle, slightly different angle. It's very much more based in, um, 
you know, film noir. Uh, it's got a gritty like crime vibe, but it doesn't really cancel anything out that's happened before. You're, you're just getting a peek at a Dick Tracy that not a lot of stories have shown, which is his early days. It's not so much an origin as like a year one and a half. Like we're, we're seeing Dick Tracy before he's firmly established before he, you know, kind of becomes the, the Warren Beatty version that we see in the film where he's very confident and set in his ways. Um, we're, we're seeing everything come together, which is a really exciting story to tell. And it's, um, you know, what Michael and I always say to each other is we're doing a crime comic first and foremost with Geraldo and the team. And it just happens to feature these iconic characters, which is not to minimize them, but is really to show readers what our focus is to tell a really great crime story with these great characters and, and uh, present them in a much more grounded way, but in a way that doesn't take away from the wonder of the stories, the, the comic strips, previous comic versions and the movie, you know, you still have a lot of that, but it's very much a grounded crime story for us. Yeah. I mean, you know, my experience being really like from the movie and thinking about that, like visual style <laughs> and you hear like, Oh, we have a new Dick Tracy uh, new series and not really being sure like what to expect. And some of the things I really um, kind of like knocked me back that I thought were just such good choices, a lot with uh, Geraldo Borges's artwork, because yeah. when you, you think of the iconic look of the comic strip character, not necessarily Warren Beatty. And then when you um, really get your first good glimpse of like the, like, square jaw dick tracy in this it's cool like, right I, it's so cool <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta tell you when i saw those pages come in i mean obviously geraldo emails pages as he's done with them which is look it's definitely improved my mood when i check my email a uh, hundredfold just to know that i'm getting pages from geraldo every day but um that one splash page that has been shown in the preview where dick tracy just walks into the crime scene it, it's it was set chills, you know, through me just because it was like the perfect introduction to the character. And um, we really wanted it to make it feel cinematic. I mean, Michael's a big film buff. I love cinema and film noir. Um, we wanted it to feel epic and important and um, kind of give it the gravitas that we felt the character deserves because to me and Michael and Chantel and, and the rest of the team, Dick Tracy's got a rogues gallery that, com you know, is comparative to Spider-Man or Batman or, you know, the great Paul Piro's you characters like Big Boy, Pruneface, Mumbles. I mean, you can just go on Flat Top as a key key villain early on. Um, so we wanted to treat him with that same level of respect. And Geraldo really just kind of hit it out of the park. Oh, yeah. And and the other thing I guess I wasn't really expecting, not being as familiar with the comic strip, but as I was getting ready for this interview and reading more about like what made, you know, why did I mean, why would, did Dick Tracy like last so long as, as a mm -hmm. comic strip and like some of the, yeah, it's still going. both yeah, and both, both the praise and like criticism of like Chester Gould's original work. Like it, sometimes he got dinged. It seemed for being kind of a little too, you know, maybe gritty or graphic in terms of at, at least for the, for the day, the thirties, forties, fifties as to how he portrayed crime. But like it, this comic does not shy away from that kind of modern sensibility, you know, in that opening scene. I mean, it was, it's brutal. And, and it's just rendered. <laughs> it is. It is brutal. Yeah. But but it's 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 rendered so kind of uh, uh, beautifully, though, in in how like horrific it is. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a challenge. You uh, you never want. And I, I think about this a lot, writing crime novels and write. you know, you write scenes of violence, but you never want to feel like it's gratuitous or you're doing it out of some kind of pleasure. You're doing it you know, you want to be evocative and you want to show the impact of violence and you want to show the power uh, that some of these characters wield over each other. So that's, you know, that's the balance you try to strike. But I think Geraldo really brings that cinematic quality to it all. And he makes, he really kind of elevates our script and it's what you always want. It's like comics. The best part of comics is jamming with somebody else and having them make your story stronger. And Geraldo really does that with every page. And, I think the, you know, the unsung heroes of every team, you know, just because of perception, but, you know, Mark Engler and Jim Campbell really bring their A game. And there's this one thing that Jim does um, in that preview sequence where he kind of letters the final caption in blood spatter. Like it's, it sounds, you have to read it to really understand it and kind of have it uh, kind of evoke the thing, you know, 
really kind of land, but he does it so perfectly and it's with such care and nuance that, you know, he's just one of the best letters in the business. And I think he gets, doesn't get enough credit. And Mark it has been a great partner to Geraldo because he does ground the colors and if, you know, the color palette feels very um, real world, but then there are these splashes of brightness that evoke the film and also evoke the comic strip, but don't take you out of the reading experience. So I think it's the perfect blend of, I think what Gould was going for in his early strips, which, which you were right, it was a very pulpy, very dark, very in your face and kind of no frills story with the wonder and bam pow of the film uh, to, to make something really new that jives perfectly with what Michael and I were, were trying to do in terms of like a gritty crime story in the Dick Tracy universe. Uh, yeah. And, and I mean, speaking of the, the colors, it, you know, depending on the different media, um, like certain things work and certain things don't like, and even with comics, certain things might work in a, in a comic strip, but not necessarily in a comic book or graphic yeah. novel might work differently in a movie, but it, it's gotta be, you know, difficult to find that right balance of that yellow trench coat within, you know, uh, like a more realistic setting, but man, it, it just, it, it doesn't, it, it stands out in all the right ways, if that makes sense. And yeah. um, I mean, both uh, this goes both to Geraldo and and Mark's work in terms of their use of light and shadow as well in this world. Um, th there's just a beautiful balance at play. Yeah, I think one of the challenges whenever you're dealing with superhero characters or pulp heroes and Dick Tracy is a pulp hero. Uh, and you're trying to bring the story into the quote unquote real world is like, how do you make these things that are inherently kind of wild and uh, they can be silly, feel grounded and you could lean too far and you could kind of lose the wonder of these elements and these characters. And we really didn't want to do that. You know, obviously we, you can't have Dick Tracy without the yellow trench coat, without the yellow hat, without the yeah. watch. You need all these elements because that's what makes the character who they are. So you have to do it in a way that feels like you're honoring the character, but also bringing him into, you know, into the real world. Like there's stories that do that really well. Like you read stuff like Miller and Mazzucchelli's Year One. Not that I'm comparing the two, but they, they bring in all the elements of Batman into the quote unquote real world, but do it in such a cool way that you don't lose the wonder of the comics, you know, um, so that's, you know, we tried to make sure that you, you can have a guy with like a prune face, you know, but you just explain it. Like you say, oh, he was scarred in the war or, you know, a character like Mumbles still has the colorful suit that's evocative of the movie, but it's a little muted. So, you know, you're, you're we're trying to honor all that's come before, not in a continuity way, but just so none of Dick Tracy's fans from any medium feel left out but we can also still tell this new story or this new kind of story uh, that really speaks to what we like as creators. Yeah. And I get that you want both the uh, fans, you know, longtime fans to be able to find something familiar that they're going to enjoy, but like somebody who's, you know, not super familiar with Dick Tracy to be able to, you know, might, you know, um, might be more fans of like maybe familiar comics wise, like Brubaker and Phillips type right. of, like crime stuff and say, Oh, but this is, you know, or, or fans of noir to find something to, you know, dig into and have those kind of. Yeah. You want it to be associate with noir. Yeah, exactly. You want it to feel accessible. You want it, you want to be able to hand it to someone in, who may not know anything about Dick Tracy and just have them read that. And they can immediately pick up and say, okay, I, I'm up to speed, you know? Um, but also there's a ton of Easter eggs, not just in the first issue, but in every issue we have written so far, if you're a diehard Dick Tracy fan, you're going to get a kick out of it. And I hope I've already, you know, I've heard from some fans already who have read it and been like, Oh, I saw this character. Or I saw this nod to uh, something else. And uh, you know, that's the fun for us, for Michael and I and Chantel, you know, as longtime fans of the property, we can weave that stuff in there, but you also don't want it to feel like you're just playing the hits. You know, you're, you're not, you're, 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 we're trying to tell a story and we can sprinkle in the Easter eggs because we love it. Um, and the fans that pick up on them, well, hopefully it'll bring a smile to their face. But if you're also coming in totally new and with no experience with Dick Tracy, it'll hopefully just be a fun crime comic. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing with like, you know, you don't, you can't just trade on nostalgia. You mm -hmm. know, you can't just play the hits because 
uh, anyone who digs into it, it'll, it'll feel flimsy. And this story right. doesn't, you know, feel that way at all. Like it, it, you know, me who has like, you know, familiarity with the movie, I think, uh, what the movie came out in 1990. So I was like, 10 or 11. I think, yeah, same. I, I think it was like the perfect hit. Um, I, I don't know if it was, uh, that movie's burned into my mind. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I, I know sometimes like critically, I think it gets, a bad rap maybe, but I think it was nominated for like seven Academy Awards. Yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, Pacino in his most like, uh, scenery chewing role ever. And that's saying a lot was nominated yeah. for best supporting actor. So, you know, uh, I think it holds up. I saw it again recently. It still, still has that wow factor. And I think right. for me as a kid, and, and you can relate to this probably just coming off something like Tim Burton's Batman, which was, so stylistic, so definitive. We're still feeling kind of the reverberations of that movie today. Dick Tracy was the next thing. Like that was the next big movie with a comic book style character. And I was, I was completely hypnotized by the movie. I, you know, I watched the movie and that that's what brought me to the newspaper strips. And that brought me to the cartoons. I read the novelizations. I had the like sticker book. I had all the stuff like I, the action figures. Like that was really the moment that the character like I said, was burned into my brain. Um, so you, you take all these influences and put them in a blender with your own like inspirations and creative desires. And, and that's really what the book is for us. It's our love for the IP, but also what kind of stories do we want to tell with these characters? And yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. Like how did, in terms of like the origins of this, uh -huh. um, was this something that like mad cave had gotten the, I mean, if you know, like had gotten the rights to and like approached you or, you know, did you, you this something that you and Michael had wanted to work on? And like, you know, because I, I think I think Warren Beatty still has the film and television rights uh, to the character. That's why. Yeah, I don't know. Popped just, up as Dick yeah. Tracy, but I, yeah. I don't think the, the publishing rights, I think, were always with Tribune. Um, yeah. Tribune owns the publishing rights and owns the character. Um so what happened is a, a while ago, almost a decade ago, um, I was thinking about Dick Tracy as a fan is wont to do. And I was like, I wonder who has the comic book rights. I, I knew that, you know, they'd, they'd often reprint the newspaper strips. And obviously there've been a few comic book stories. W one, one of them that I really remember fondly was the Kyle Baker uh, four issue miniseries he did right around the movie, which is just fantastic. Just beautiful stuff. Like similar to what Kyle was doing on the shadow uh, in that vein, just like a really lively reimagining. Um, I think it's out of print. I have a copy of the trade on my shelf. I'm looking at it now, but, um, so I reached out to Tribune and I was at Archie at the time and I reached out and said, does anyone have the publishing rights for comics? If not, we would be interested. And so, um, for whatever reason that didn't materialize, we announced it, but you know, we had, there was an issue with the license and we, we, we ended up not having the license at the time. And, you know, it was disappointing, but these things happen. It's a business. Um, yeah. But Michael and I were just so obsessed with the story we had in mind and the things we wanted to do. Um, and then we looped in Chantel who, who has a great, you know, very acclaimed background as an editor and a writer and a publishing person and we all just kind of teamed up and got the license ourselves. You know, we reached out to Tribune, got the license, um, and then really started shopping it. We spoke to Mad Cave and they were interested. And, and that, that just seemed like the perfect home because we didn't know it at the time, but then they've been building this Paul Piro line almost. And um, they were really up for the tape we had. Um, and that's really where the connection happened. And, uh, and thankfully it worked out and, you know, I can't believe we're like a month away from the book actually hitting stands. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think people are going to go nuts for it. I mean, I hope so. Yeah. It's such a fun first issue. I mean, Geraldo's art, I mean, we said it earlier, but is just game changer. It, yeah. yeah, it is. It is phenomenal. And I just love that. It's a story that seems so, you know, familiar and does have those elements. But um, I mean, I was hooked right away. Oh, thank from you. That, that cold open. To try and okay. figure out like why are these two characters meeting what's going on um and especially you know what i really loved about it uh which is not it, it's so important to do in comics but can be tough when you're doing a crime comic or doing the war is the pacing yeah and that pacing of that cold open and how it it plays out especially um with marsh's character is just thank you spot on um, I appreciate that. Yeah, we really kind of labored on that. 
Yeah. <laughs> we, we went over that script a couple times and we definitely wanted each, we wanted that op- those opening pages to just kind of punch you in the gut. Like we didn't want it to feel like a slow burn. Like we really wanted to establish the world, establish the tone, establish the characters and the inciting incident. And then, you know, I love what Geraldo did really well. And it was in the script, but the way he rolled it out was really masterful was, you know, you, you have the two characters talking in the diner, you see them through the window, then you see the shadow of the killers and you already know something's happening. Something bad is coming. And um, yeah, I'm really proud of the first issue. I'm glad it seems to be resonating. We definitely have a ton of stories to tell. So I'm, I'm thankful that Mad Cape has given us a lot of runway to kind of let things breathe. You know, we're, we're, we're obviously the pace is good and we're trying to keep things exciting with each issue, but we're also planting seeds for a much longer run, which is our hope. Yeah. Well, I, I hope so too. Uh, because I really yeah. like the first <laughs> issue of. All right, let's take a quick break. What in the Sam Hill is happening right now? What is that? Yeah, what is You like bards? Yeah, what is Oh, you like band of bards. It's not my fault, you mumble. <laughs> that makes sense. They're dropping some great new series right now. There's that one about a heavy metal guitarist in the 1970s with monsters, working class wizards. You know how we love monsters around here. And my friend Dakota Brown, he's working on a project, uh, Grandma Tilly's Hell Tech Mech with Lane Lloyd. I saw the preview for that. That is crazy. Jimmy even contributed to their anthology from the static and had Matt Sumo on the podcast to talk about his project, The Bardic Verses, which... Makes a lot of sense that the project landed there. Yeah, where you are, blah, blah, blah. Where can you find them? You need to get out more. They are in previews, or you can visit their website, bandabars.com, for all the latest. Can we turn the music off now? <laughs> Thank you. No more surprises, minstrels, or anything like that, or I'll rent you out to the Ren Fair as a children's ride. <laughs> Let's get back to the show. How do you and, and Michael work in terms of... Um you know, co-writing it. And, uh, you know, how, how does Chantel as the mm-hmm. creative consultant, like, you know, add to that work? I'm always curious when I talk to co-writers, whether or not it's, you know, I'll take a pass, they'll take a pass, or it's, I do this section, this person does that section, or, you know, how that worked with It's you pretty Michael. democratic. You know, Michael and I have worked together for a while. We did the series called The Awakened for Zest World, which was, um, the high concept was basically like incognito meets the justice society. So it's a very crime noir story told through the, the tropes of, you know, an Avengers or justice society type super team. Um, and you know, we're, it's pretty democratic. Like it, we're, we're at 50% for each issue. It's very rare that like one of us will do the heavy lifting on an issue and the other one doesn't. Um, what we do is we talk it through, we'll hop on the phone and kind of chat through the arc or the big, the first story arc. And then one of us will type it up and we'll go back and forth on the plot. And, um, and then we just say, do you want to do the first half or the back half? And we kind of alternate. Uh, so, and then we'll, we'll trade off, you know? And so I'll, he'll write the first chunk or I'll write it and then we'll send it to the other person. And then when, when we're writing the next half, we edit the first part as we go and then flip it back to the other writer. So everyone's kind of touched each half uh, equally almost aside from the, the generative stuff. Um, it's worked out pretty well. Like I, I think what I like about working with Michael is that there's not any ego, like best idea wins. And, you know, sometimes I'll say, well, this doesn't work for me. I would suggest this or, or he'll do the same. And it's never, it never gets defensive or combative. And um, Chantel has been essential to the process. She's just a voice in the room. You know, she's been a key part in getting the book to happen. And, you know, she, she looks over the stuff and, and gives comments and, um, and so does Mad Cave, you know, our editor, Chaz Pangberg has been fantastic to deal with and is really just like kind of the, the, the connective tissue that keeps everyone on the same page. So, um, yeah, it's been a really smooth experience. So I'm happy with, with everyone and, and the team itself, like Geraldo and Mark and Jim, just like all-star crew. And so I hope we get to keep it going for as long as possible. Uh, are there like a, a planned number of issues for this at least first arc? Uh, the first arc's five, and then you know, and then hopefully we'll have another arc. But it, we're we're treating it as an ongoing. That's Mad Caves announced it as an ongoing series. So, yeah, um, that's what I thought. I just wanted to to you know, was curious about the the first arc of it. Yeah, but, um, yeah. I mean, as I got uh, into the issue to kind of see it all 
play out. Um, it, I really love those, you know, noir elements, how they've been I- embraced. And it's, it's interesting I, reading some of like Michael's stuff previously. And I, mm-hmm. I, I think Michael's also uh, with someone else has just started like a uh, filmographers podcast. Yeah. I yeah. know, you know, his work in, in, in terms of his, um, his screenwriting and, uh, you know, following him on, on Twitter and, hear him talk about film, but I mean, your experience in terms of you've written with like, the Pete Fernandez mm-hmm. series of novels, not to mention secret identity yeah. and um, the follow-up alter ego. Um, I, quite a pedigree. I mean, between the two of you <laughs> in, in this, like that, that seems to really fit with this style, you know, uh, well, is there, you know, a difference when you're plotting out, a, a mystery or you know a crime story in terms of writing prose or or comics or is it just kind of uh all the same to you um it's not i mean it all starts in the same place you know you have to figure out the story with a mystery of any kind i'm a plotter i'm an outliner and i think michael is too we, you have to know where you're going to to throw in red herrings you know I, I think readers can tell when someone is just vamping and making stuff up as they go because it just doesn't all click into place at once. Um, you know, and I think, I, I think the outlining process can start, doesn't have to start at the beginning. Like you can vamp a little bit at the beginning and then start mapping things out based on the, the breadcrumbs you've laid out. But um, right. I do think comic book plotting, the pacing is just different with a novel. It's, it fe- it's much more organic. You can, you can have as much runway as you want. Like I've written novels that are 60,000 words. I've written novels that are a hundred thousand words. It's just like, what, what does, what container fits the story and, and lets the story breathe. Whereas with comics, it's much more, I hate to say the word algorithmic because it makes it sound like, like math. And, but it is a little mathematical. Like you have X amount of pages, you can do as X, you know, Y amount of panels in each panel. You can only have so many word balloons and so many words in the balloon. So it isn't to say we 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 run the story through a filter or anything, but you you know the you know the sandbox, you know the framework of what you can do. Um, so you kind of do that, keep that in mind. So we knew we had five issues. We knew we had X amount of pages per issue, and and uh, now I'm just making it sound scientific, but really we knew <laughs> we knew we wanted to establish Dick Tracy and kind of establish his world, but we also wanted to show these characters not as their peak selves yet. So you get like kind of early days of Dick Tracy, early days of Lips Manless and the Underworld and just what the lay of the land is and a a kind of a nice snapshot of post-World War II America before the 50s, before, you know, this era of, you know, kind of white picket fences and and what have you. Like it's a very un stable period and um that was really fascinating to us we didn't want to do anything where we were like this is dick tracy but in the it, today it just felt it didn't really ring true to us so we wanted to make sure it was a historical crime story i hope that answered your question no no it, it, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it did it, yeah i mean we talk a lot i think it's come up in this podcast when i ask you know when we we talk about comic book storytelling in particular like the, mm-hmm. the the economy of storytelling, you know, and it's not necessarily that it's, I mean, maybe it is, you know, like you said, mathematical and not. Well, it's collaborative too. Like that's the yeah. difference. Like when I'm writing a novel, I'm the final verdict. I mean, eventually my editor is going to look at it and could say, this is terrible or you should change <laughs> this. But at the end, it's a much more complete product. Whereas with a comic book, you know, Michael and I have to kind of sit and figure out the story and we have to leave room for Geraldo to really put his stamp on it. Otherwise it's not interesting to him. Mark has a go at it in terms of the visuals and the color and Jim has time to chime in. And so does Chantel. So it's really like a rock band almost like you're all doing your parts and you hope that when it all comes together, it feels better than any single element. Um, Whereas with a novel, all the weight is on the writer in terms of you're the writer, the screenwriter, the director, the cinematographer, all these things at once. Whereas uh, in a comic, you kind of, do your part and let the other person shine too. And hopefully the whole thing works together. Yeah, no, I mean that, I mean, it makes sense. And, um, I think the final product shows that you guys were all, uh, you know, playing the same tune. 
Because oh, good. Yeah, I mean, we're proud of it. Yeah, it feels like it, it's a, it felt like a really strong launch for us, and I'm excited for people to read it soon. It's crazy. It's coming. Yeah, and, and <laughs> fantastic cover, by the way, as well. I mean, I know there's, I think there's, a, I think Mad Cave offered a few different yeah. ones. There's like some retail incentive uh, variant covers, but, uh, you know. Yeah, Francesco cover, has one. Francesco Francavia, Sean Martinborough has a great one. Oh, they're all great. Uh, Thomas Patilli has one. Um, yeah, there's so many Tula Latte, and uh, yeah, there's just a bunch of great covers, and I, I think, you know, get them all if you want, if that's your bag, or just get the one you <laughs> like the most. Uh, yeah, the, but the, um, I think the, I, I think the A cover is Geraldo Borges and um, Mark uh, Engler. Yeah, his um, cover is iconic. Yeah, yeah, and I, the prominently, it's the, you know, the, the, it's Dick Tracy and Shadow prominently mm -hmm. features the the wristwatch, watch, yeah. which I, I think Chester Gould took credit for, you know, kind of I inventing when it eventually came out. A, yeah, the you know, Apple Watch. <laughs> yeah, a few years later. Yeah, you know, that, that question came up so many times when we announced the book. People were like, is he going to have the watch? Is he going to have the watch? And of course he's going to have the watch. Like, it's a Dick Tracy story, so we'll make it work. Yeah. <laughs> you make it work. That's what you do. Like, you know, it's like asking, is Batman going to have his utility belt? I mean, it's what he is. Yeah, it's a it's a, a key part of the, mm -hmm. uh, of, the mythos. Uh, of the character. You know, yeah. it's it. Uh, re when I was reading about Chester Gould and like digging into more about Dick Tracy, it's funny when you say like you know you're a plotter and and planning everything out because one of the things I, I I thought that was interesting, it made me want to kind of get into some more of the actual Dick Tracy comic strips, which I guess is mm -hmm. a fun thing about this if you're not familiar with to be able to go back and try and find some of those. I think IDW before has put out some of like the Dick Tracy comic strip collection. Yeah, and I think Clover Press is doing some too. Yeah, but um, I had read that he, like the Chester Gould, kind of liked to improvise. You know, as he went, didn't really plan things out, like to the point where he would sometimes get Dick Tracy caught in something he couldn't quite, yeah, like solve. <laughs> yeah, I mean that just gives me stress just hearing it as a plotter. Like I it just, I'm a big outliner, so I like to know what the what peril I'm putting the characters in. Though I think I heard Mark Wade, uh, who's fantastic, obviously he would he said he sometimes scripts and intentionally leaves the cliffhanger in such a way that he has to then write himself out of the problem in the next issue, which is amazing. Like, you know, there's just writers that can do that. And there's writers that choose the uh, path of caution, which is my path, but, um, or, you know, like Michael Connolly who writes the Harry Bosch novels and the Lincoln lawyer books um, and Stephen King, they don't outline at all. They just start on page one and, and they kind of have an idea of what the story is going to be. And they just start typing. Um, everybody's different, whatever works. Yeah, I mean that's there's no you know tried and true method right. as long as it works for you as long as you um as long as you can get there uh, yeah to tell the 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 story that kind of you know you want to tell um, exactly you know I wanted to ask a little bit before I let you go just to veer off from Dick Tracy a little bit in terms sure. of your own kind of like uh, uh, pedigree in terms of comics um, mm -hmm. so what kind of brought you into you know, writing comics because I mean, you've written a bunch of different things, and I know you've you've done several comic series. Um, yeah, was comics something you were always uh, a fan of and knew you wanted to write, or kind of how did you first get your start in terms of writing comics as opposed to the you know, like the Pete Fernandez novels? Or you know, I mean, yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I grew up reading comics. My first comic was like an Archie comic that my mom got me at the grocery store. Uh, I started getting superhero like Marvel and DC stuff and dark horse at the newsstand, you know, I'd bike to the grocery store or to the pharmacy and every week and hope that they had Spider-Man or Batman or whatever I was into or the X-Men and you'd have your B titles. You know, it was the, the days before really comic shops, comic shops existed. Uh, I didn't have one nearby yet. So it was really kind of a crapshoot, like whatever was at the newsstand, you hoped you would get uh, the ones you wanted. And then eventually I found a, a local comic shop near my grandparents' house, Frank's Comics and Cards, which I would walk to. And then I could, you know, have a pull list and do all the things that we do, um, you know, you do as a fan. Um, but yeah, I, I got into, I worked at Wizard Magazine, which was huge at the time. It was like the tastemaker magazine in comics in the um, early 90s to the 2000s. And so... That was my kind of first foray into the industry as a professional, like full time. And then eventually I started working at DC Comics as a publicity in the publicity department. Um, 
the challenge there is if, you know, if you're working at DC in publicity, you, you can see all the stuff come together, but you can't really contribute. So I knew I wanted to write. I always knew I wanted to write. I knew I wanted to tell stories even before I really realized what that meant. Like you, I'd read a Spider-Man comic and then I'd kind of draw my own iteration. And so you, I was creating stories, even though I wasn't really clear on what I was doing yet. Um, but even then at DC, I wanted to write. And so I was kind of like absorbing what people were doing as a sponge and talking to creators and editors. Um, but my first comic book opportunity um, was after that was when I moved to Archie to do um, publicity and marketing for them. Because, you know, when you're at a smaller company, I think the rules are a little different. They're not as corporate. And so they were totally fine with, you know, uh, someone in-house writing comics. It wasn't a big deal. And so I wrote um, my first full comic was a, a Comic-Con story where Archie and his friends go to Comic-Con and they all cosplay as different characters. And that was fun. I mean, I grew up reading Archie. Yeah. I love those characters. I have a great fondness for that world. Um, and then it really just continued from there. Um, and at the same time, I was writing these novels because when I was at DC, I was reading a lot of mystery novels, you know, um, you know, when, when comics becomes your job uh, and you get a stack of all the comics coming out each week, you try to, I found it, I tried to find another like creative outlet. And so I was reading a lot of mystery novels and then that got me to try and write my own mystery novel. And um, that was the Pete Fernandez series. So those started around then. Um, and yeah, and then my comic stuff started at a little few years later once I was at Archie and um, I did a lot of work for them. I wrote, a ton of like, you know, Archie meets Kiss, Archie meets Ramones, the Archies, Archie B-52s. And so um, I kind of found that little niche of music comics and music comics with Archie and um, and really the Black Ghost, which I did for Comixology and Dark Horse with Monica Gallagher and George Camadeus, who's doing Gargoyles for Dynamite now. Um, that was my first creator own series. And that was really what opened the door to doing more non um, work for hire stuff. No, Sorry, that was like a long rambling answer to. Uh, to no, your no, I, I I appreciate it. Yeah. I you know I I, I think well, look one of the things I try and do with the the podcast is you know for listeners um, mm -hmm. you know somebody just who listens to the episodes and we have a lot of you know really good listeners I I feel like and yeah. um, uh, what you know you're getting into this and kind of want to know like you know how you got into this you know, creative side of things. I I'm always fascinated by like, we, we all love, I think everybody has like lo love stories, love storytelling, yeah. whether or not oh. it's reading or television or movies, whatever it might be. But to take that leap to, you know, wanting to get your own stories out there or even, you know, telling stories with, you know, uh, the characters that you love, like whatever it might be. Um, yeah, I think it always felt like I'm it, fascinated by it. Yeah, it always felt like something I wanted to do, even as a kid. Like I was saying, like um, it was a different time. You know, it was an era where you couldn't just Google something and find out everything about a character. Like there was no like it was the early days of like fandom online. Even or even when I was a kid, there was no online. You know, there was maybe like AOL or CompuServe or what have you. So the way you'd educate yourself about your these characters was through stuff like the Marvel trading cards or the DC trading cards. And so I would write stories for myself just to kind of fill those gaps. Like why did the original X-Men leave the X-Men? I didn't know. I hadn't read the comics yet, but I knew that there were these two teams. And so you, you kind of create your own answers to the questions. And um, it wasn't until later on that I realized, okay, I want to tell these stories professionally or try to, but um, you, you always have that desire. And so I, I think, you know, the big secret, I think, for a lot of writers is we probably end up doing this for free just because we have to get the stories out. But, you know, don't tell don't tell your agents that or don't, don't tell your editors that. <laughs> yeah. Well, then it seems like, you know, for everything you've, you've just said and what, you know, that our listeners heard and what I've you know read about you preparing for this interview, it seems like secret identity is kind of like the perfect culmination of like all of that in terms of the mystery side of it, the comic yeah. side of it. and. um uh, if, if listeners, for anyone who hasn't, you, you you should really do yourself a favor. Oh, thanks. Uh, and go get uh, Secret Identity and then the follow-ups, um, Alter Ego. Yeah, Alter Ego comes out at the end of this year. And yeah, Secret Identity is very personal work in that it blends all my passions, um, noir, crime novels, comics. There are literally comic book sequences in the novel. It's a, it's a murder mystery set in the 1970s comic book industry in New York. 
Uh, and it follows a woman, a Cuban American queer woman, Carmen Valdez, who moves from Miami to New York to pursue her career in comics. And she gets this like dead end job at this third rate publisher called triumph comics. And all through her time there, she's pitching stories to her editor, her boss, uh, the editor in chief, she's his secretary until he finally says, just stop pitching me ideas. I have other freelancers I need to entertain. I have to do other things. Like I want you to do your job and I'll have a, I have a plan for you later. Um, Mm -hmm. So despondent, she runs into another colleague who says, I have this idea for a character that's been greenlit. Do you want to co-write it with me? But it's just got to be in secret. You know, I'll, I'll eventually tell our boss that you're doing it. But for now, let's do it under under cover. Um, and they co-create this character called the Legendary Lynx, who's a little bit of Daredevil, a little bit of Batman, a little bit of Spider-Woman, um, the street level vigilante who protects Triumph City, which is their big fictional city. Um, and now I'm just giving you kind of the synopsis, but you know, basically what happens is her collaborator is murdered. So no one knows that Carmen has created this character who then becomes the hit for triumph comics. It then becomes like huge. (laughs) Yeah. Relative. I mean, obviously it's a a smaller company, but But, her, you know, and that lights a fire under her. Like she has to solve the murder because she needs to reclaim this character because Otherwise, it's she knows comics. She knows eventually, like once the scripts are burned through, someone else is going to get a chance to write her baby, and she doesn't want that to happen. And so, um, yeah, it's a love letter to comics. It's a love letter to the industry at that time. And um, Alter Ego picks it up in the modern day. So hopefully, you know, if you haven't read Secret Identity, you can you can dive into Alter Ego without reading Secret Identity. Obviously, if you've read them, read Secret Identity, you'll get a little bit more out of it. But um, it's very much the other side of the coin. It's about um, a filmmaker who used to work in comics as an artist, she left the industry, found some success in film, but then finds herself being pulled back into comics because this new company is relaunching a library of characters based on these obscure seventies properties. And one of them is the legendary links, a character that Annie, the protagonist has a great affinity for because she felt a great connection to the character as a kid growing up. But, um, as she gets deeper into the assignment, she realizes that there's much more to the origins of the links and who created the links and, and the people that want to keep that story a secret. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, 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 you know, it's, it's kind of um, interesting just talking about Dick Tracy and then, and talking about those two books. Yeah. Um, because they're, they're again, it's a great setting for uh, a, a mystery novel, you know, yeah. but they're so, there's so much richness there for folks that are like comic fans who like kind of understand the stories of the industry to, to dig into. So if you don't know anything about comics and you're like, I like a, just like a good old mystery. Great. But yeah. there's, there's, it's, you know, like hiding those Easter eggs for fans of Dick Tracy. There's a lot in there for folks that have been paying attention to comics for the past, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's, if you know and love comic book history, there's a ton of nods to real people. Obviously, you know, none of them are main characters. You can't, you know, legally you can't have like, you know, uh, Jack Kirby solving a mystery, but you know, it's woven through real world events. Like Carmen goes to a convention in 1975 uh, in New York city. And that was a real event. And the guests that I referenced were people that were actually there and, you know, it. I, I tr- I'm, I'm a big fan of metafiction, you know, stories that kind of live in the real world. Like I've gotten emails from people saying, oh, you know, th- those Lynx comics actually come out. Like, you know, was, you know, what happened to Triumph? And it's just great because that means you succeeded. You know, you, you really like kind of evoke the era so well that people almost believe that this could have happened and it could have happened. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, listeners, for anyone that hasn't, um, uh, mix in with your comics reading uh, of, secret identity and then yeah thank you for for alter ego um but you know just kind of like a final thought here but yeah uh, april 24th dick tracy number one i just uh made me want to go back and and watch the 1990 film that i don't think i've seen in maybe 30 years it holds up uh, it's pretty fun yeah and um yeah uh, like we said, I you know nominated for seven Oscars. I think won three of them. Uh, yeah. Best song, uh, music and lyrics by Stephen Sondheim. I mean, has the can't, that movie has quite a pedigree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Danny Elfman theme, Madonna soundtrack, Stephen Sondheim. Like, uh, the cast is insane. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I think this is just a fantastic first issue for. Thank you so um, much. 
fans of the character, I think, are really going to find a lot to dig into. But even if you're not, and even if like me, your only real reference point is, you know, Warren Beatty in that, uh, uh, in the 1990 movie, it is a really kind of grounded, uh, crime story. It's set in 1947. Uh, it, it looks, looks awesome on the page. And yeah. Geraldo I, and Mark and Jim just did an amazing job. I really think fans are are going to like it. And I'm a big fan of what Mad Cave has been putting out recently. And um, I think this is a, another one that I, I really hope folks pay attention to because uh, I want to see uh, want to see more of it. I'm excited for where the rest of the story goes. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, no, this has been great to just chat about it. And, uh, and uh, I'm excited for the response. You know, people have been very positive and I can't wait for it to be out there. Yeah, absolutely. So be sure, listeners, to uh, add it to your pull list. And um, oh, I almost forgot. I always shout out my to my brother Bobby, the Cryptic Creator Corner's number one most dedicated listener. Bobby listens to all my episodes, and we just got back nice. from Ireland. This is my first podcast being recorded after I, Bobby and I took a trip to the Emerald Isle for my forty fifth birthday. Oh, uh, welcome back! Happy birthday! Oh, thank you very much, Alex. What but, is your uh, birthday? Uh, my it was uh, the fourteenth so. of March. Yeah, yeah, March. Oh, 14th. I'm the fifteenth. Yeah. Oh, well, happy yeah. belated birthday to you as well. Yeah, the Ides. Beware the Ides of March. <laughs> yeah, I'm Pi Day, so yeah. I got that. Which That's is a little, nice. Yeah, a little more cheerful than uh, <laughs> killing Caesar. Yeah, it's true. But, um, yeah, so listeners, April 24th, let your comic book shop know wherever you get your comics. That uh, And I think you usually made Cave, you can actually go to their site as well if you don't have a local shop near you. Yeah. Um, but Dick Tracy, number one, I really like that. That that a cover by uh, uh Borges and uh and Angler, but there's a, a couple of really nice covers out there if you're the type of person that goes all in on that you're gonna and i just think you're gonna find a lot to uh to love about this comic so uh alex thank you very much for coming on the My podcast pleasure. i i really appreciate it and um wish you guys the best of luck with uh with the launch of uh of dick tracy yeah thanks so much it was this was really fun and hopefully we'll chat again soon yeah i'd l- love it absolutely love it um All right, listeners, uh, for Comic Book Yeti, Cryptic Creator Corner, I am Jimmy Gasparro. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Rate and review us and do all those other things they tell you to do about podcasts because it really does help. And um, we like to to hear that you're you're, you're enjoying what we're putting out there. Uh, We're doing it, you know, for you so we can connect you with great comic creators and some really great comics. And uh, Dick Tracy, number one, April 24th. Uh, Thank you, you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. This is Byron O'Neill, one of your hosts of the Cryptid Creator Corner, brought to you by Comic Book Yeti. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Please rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. It lets us know how we're doing, and more importantly, how we can improve. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of the Cryptid Creator Corner, maybe you would enjoy our sister podcast, Into the Comics Cave. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.